a little uncomfortable uh, with what I'm going to start with, but let's give it a shot. Okay, uh, let me know if you can see my screen. Can you see my screen? Uh, yes, we now we can see the whole picture. Perfect. Yeah, you can see um, there's an artwork right in front of you, yeah? Uh, can you also hear me properly in spite of this in the background? Yeah, yes. we don't hear your background. Oh, you don't? Oh, okay. no, that's great. <laughs> that's great because I can only hear firecrackers. <laughs> so, okay, that's good. Uh, fine. Okay, so we'll start it off with something that we usually do, which is look at artworks. I mean, you can't talk about art history without looking at artworks. So let's get right into it. I'm just going to, this is my favorite work of art, one of them. Uh, I stay away from words like favorite and all, but I'll tell you why this one is my favorite. So I'll just invite some responses. Uh, do you have any interpretations that you'd like to offer to this? Everybody's welcome to unmute and go for it. We are going to have a lot of conversations because we are a small group, so I'll really encourage participation. I'm getting like a somatic response. Um, so I get, feel like a kind of expansive feeling in my chest. I'm enjoying the color. Um, I love that. You like the color. That's beautiful. Um, what about the others? Thank you for that, Alexandra. I'm kind of seeing like a um, yin and yang symbol in the middle. Yeah. And this, this... Uh, it also looks like a booby. <laughs> Or an oh. eye, you know, like, uh, yeah, my mind can make a lot of shapes with this. Yeah, you're very right. It could be an eye. It could be uh, a breast. It could be female anatomy in that way. A lot of people connected to a womb. I've heard that a lot. I have heard um, what you said, uh, yin-yang, a lot as well. So let's get some more uh, ideas in. I was thinking it was... In the invocation of a yin yang, the yin yang doesn't just appear, you have to make it right. Mm -hmm. So it's not there yet, but it is invoking it. The present, like a situation where a yin yang is invoked, is what that concept is invoked. Oh, that sounds beautiful. That sounds lovely. Great. I love how all your interpretations are speaking to each other in some way. Let's get some more thoughts in. Twenty, you have a thought on this? You don't have to, like, don't feel compelled to say something, but if you want to, you're welcome to. You're allowed to have different interpretations as well. You like it. I see a heart. So you're simply like, I like it. Okay. Rima, you have something to add, perhaps? The only thing I could think of was blood. Oh, and good. That, that's about it. Like, um, yeah. and, and I did see the whole yin yang thing, but. I don't have an interpretation. I just like the, the color red, the only thing that I thought of was blood. That's wonderful. The color red to you was blood, which has multiple connotations that one can attach to it, pleasant and unpleasant. For Alexandra, it was the red was the you know road to sort of feeling in certain expansion uh, while viewing the work of art. I'm just going to show you a little like close ups of it, right? Uh, just to show you what the strokes look like, just the uh, kind of paints that have been applied. This yin yang is obviously attached onto the artwork. So, you know, whatever you want to make of it, you can, right? So, um, any changes in your interpretations, any additions you want to make to it? It's like a lot of movement. A That's lot of dyna dynamic. Yeah, it's very, very gestural, very dynamic. So I have gone around showing this. Anybody else? Uh, from close, doesn't look um, like a yin yang anymore. <laughs> so it's, other, it's more like an eye, like uh, you know, the yeah. shape. Sure. sure, that's great. That's great. So I've shown this work in a lot of places. And depending on the people I show it to, I get very different responses. So with my university students, uh, in my neoliberal universities, I usually hear... Um, Marxism, <laughs> because it's red. Uh, I've heard uh, womb a lot, depending on, you know, the kind of students I'm engaging with. I've heard lots of things about this work of art. I do want to introduce it to the artist. This is the only time I think I sort of introduce the artist. Otherwise, I prefer to do artist-free work. But let's see the artist. 
So that's the artist. Now, this is why I said it's one of my favorite works of art. It's from uh, when it was created, Connor was a five-year-old boy uh, who was just having a really great day. He has ice cream in one hand, he has a paintbrush in the other, and he's just going at a rather large canvas. And the yin yang that we see, or the eye that we see, is actually the sponge that he painted with. It just so happens that it got stuck to the canvas, <laughs> right? So, I mean, to start us off, I wanted to bring this work of art because I want to take away the baggage of history or of knowledge from the very discipline of art. How do you experience it? How do you talk about it? It doesn't need you to know anything else except from your experience of it. If you happen to do, that's great, good for you. But it doesn't need that for the first engagement, right? Because obviously, Connor clearly was not thinking about Marxism. He was not thinking about, say, yin yang. I mean, I'm assuming we can do a Freudian analysis on Connor, but I doubt Connor had any of this going on in his mind as a five year old kid. He was just having fun. He was doing something that we call play right, that we sort of move away from as we grow up or as we get more institutionalized in certain ways. So Connor was simply playing, right? And I invite us today to think about how we can play with art history, if at all that's possible, right? So moving on, any questions, anything, just stop me. We'll keep it really conversational because we're a short group. But if you have any thoughts, any epiphanies, <laughs> you know, uh, please do just unmute and add to the conversation, yeah? So primarily because this is about making art history inclusive, I have uh, obviously borrowed a lot of the work that we do uh, at, with Artmosphere, with my organization, wherever we are working. This is the principle we follow when we have to talk about art history with our students, our learners, our teachers, our educators. That's the philosophy we use. So a little bit of it will also be like me summarizing some of that experience and telling you how we do it there. But I'll try to keep it a little more conversational. Yeah. So. Based on this, what we follow is the artwork first approach to art history. Now, this is not the conventional approach, because the conventional approach would expect you to know something like this. Yeah, some stuff like this. If anybody's familiar, there are all these art movements and times that we denote, right? So which is what is intimidating? Of course, there's the Renaissance, there is Expressionism, there's Romanticism, right? And then what we do very conveniently, alongside all these isms and ons, we tend to give them dates. We tend to give them time. We tend to say this movement was from this to this, this to this, right? This is conventional art history. Like I can give you this snapshot because sadly, this is also how I was taught. I was taught art history linearly. I was taught art history as a chronology. And then you're like, oh, make your own connections kind of a thing, right? But of course, this is the way uh, that is normally accepted and maybe even taught, right? Discussed. Taught is not a very nice word, I'm not too fond of it. Um, oh, <laughs> oh, wow. Um, you've got to ask somebody who works with etymology or somebody who works with how words are made, maybe Raymond Williams. <laughs> I'm not the person for that. Uh, what difference is something from an ons to an ism? But I can tell you def definitely that um, ism is definitely a style. Ons is like this period. So Renaissance is a period. Realism is can also be a style, but it was popular during this particular period. So maybe that's... The pattern I see is ons yeah. is longer than ism. Yeah. Time period at the very least. Oh, oh yes. Yes, Renaissance is a very long time period. Yes, it 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 was a very long... It was called Renaissance because it was the new ways of learning. Suddenly it was more about finding out things beyond religion and also engaging with science and discovery and all of that. So all your Vinci's and all these guys, but um, we want to move away from that category. <laughs> we want to move away from the Vinci's and the Angelos only, right? Uh, so what we're going to do next is I'm going to show you a couple of things and then we're going to have a conversation around them. Yeah. Okay. Do you see what's on your screen? Okay, uh, does anybody want to venture describing what you see on the left? Just describing, I don't need interpretations. I see the sky. Yeah, great. I see 
the sky being and there is a frame in which through which you see the sky oh very good yeah definitely it's a part of a painting it's not the entire painting that i brought up here but that's very good what do you see in the foreground of course the background is the sky and everything what's in front of the sky there is a dog and then the dog is looking back at another dog's back right and then yeah. there all the people sure so people having supper dinner something's happening some meal is happening and people are sitting around with each other and they happen to be really cute dogs in the frame as well yeah can somebody do the same thing for the right the image on the right there's a person sitting in a garden or a natural space a lot of flowers and tree i think the tree is blooming mm -hmm. and um, i think he might be writing or something i don't know but he's doing something um, on a day out okay that's good uh, you sure it's a he it could be a she i don't know i, didn't need I, to think I don't know the person but like yeah. there's a person basically said uh, having a day out and doing something outside all right, great. Uh, do you want to point out any similarities between the two artworks that you see before you? Do you see similarities? I can see similarity. The inclination of the neck between what I assume is Jesus and what I assume is this other person. Yeah. That inclination is similar. Of That's very really good. Yeah. That's very interesting. I was not thinking of the inclination when I put it together, but that's very interesting. Yeah, that's really nice. Thank you. New perspective. Anybody else? It's also like from a from a front perspective, it's not from like top down or yeah, yeah. Definitely straight. Yeah, frontal perspective, right? Um yeah. anybody wants to highlight differences in this? No differences? There is a script inside the image. Yeah, uh, I can zoom in. I can zoom in a little bit if you'd like. There is a script inside that and which shows something which I cannot yeah. either. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's good. Anything else? Okay, if not, they both belong to this period. Yeah? But they're from very different places, right? One is Persian and one is by an Italian artist. Yeah? This is 1573 and this is between 1549 to 1556. Now it belongs to Renaissance, but the way of the art is very different. The styles are very different. One Apart from the material, we can get into tempera, we can get into this is fresco, this is that, all of that can come later. But apart from even the subject matter, look at the way the framing is done here and look at the way the framing is done here. This is clearly a miniature work of art, like a really small postcard size of art, the one you see on your right. The one you see on your left is sizable, right? It's, it's, this, like it's big. This is smaller. I can go into the content and tell you this is by Mir Sayyad Ali right, who was uh, in uh, Humayu's court. And this is apparently his self-portrait, one of the self first self-portraits recorded in South Asia, painted by an artist, right? But I don't want to get into that before I get into what the larger point is. So before I link that larger point, I'm going to show you another work of art. Yeah? What do you see on the left and what do you see on the right? Or more like it, do you see any similarities between what's on the left and what's on the right? Maybe the material of the broom or I don't know. Wonderful. Whatever that guy the, the guy that he's whatever the guy is carrying is like the material seems seems similar to what these women nice. are carrying. Nice. Uh when you say both are perhaps at work, fantastic. Mm -hmm. Believable. The, what are the look like from the same in area, the same um, um, time, place and time? 
Oh, that's very interesting. Eva, why do you say that? What seems um, uh, to me? The clothing, maybe, yeah, because of the, uh, the clothing. Mm -hmm. It looks for me uh, really e European both. Also the men at the right side. And oh. uh, also the things they're having in their hands. This like, um, I don't know how it's called in English, but um, they make this, uh, what he has, but uh, a room, is that how you call it? Mm, yeah. They yeah, they make a lot of, of this with uh, this material. And I think it's the same they the ladies are having in their hand. Fantastic. And these are great observations. These are great observations because that is true. Both of them belong to the same time period, like you said, but very different places. One is the one on the left is French and the one on our right is Cuban. So you're not wrong about European influence because Cuba around that time would have been influenced by the same. Know, yeah, yeah. That is for sure. But the style is very different, right? One is what you call, as we saw here, realism, right? The whole idea of 1830 to 1890, we're going to make everything look realistic. We're going to move away mm. from Renaissance and we're going to move towards realism, right? But what we see on the right is hardly realistic. Faces are not usually this big compared to the rest of the body, right? Something sim different seems to be happening in the same time period at different places. Let's look at this, for instance. Does anybody recognize the person on the left? Mm. Okay, never mind. I will. That's fine. I thought there was something in the chat. Did I miss something? Please feel free to unmute and speak also because I think when you're sharing, it becomes a little. No, I'm uh, I'm having the chat. Uh, I will help you if you miss something. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Eva. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. what came Say to me was with all the layers, with, is my voice audible? Yeah, yeah, I can hear you now. So, uh, with all the images that were coming together, I, I pushed myself into a movie scene of okay. Django Unchained. Oh, wow. <laughs> okay. Tarantino. <laughs> yeah, just merging the two together into Tarantino. Yeah. Oh, is no, it Yoko the... Ono or not? My imagination. Yeah. Is it Yoko Ono or is that just it random? Is... <laughs> okay. yeah, it's yeah. I very randomly put together with something else, right? But that is the point I'm trying to make here. Um, okay, so what Yoko Ono seems to be doing, Yoko Ono is an artist who combined performance art, performance and art. It's another genre of art in art history, right? So it's here. It started in the 1960s and it's going on. 1960s is when it's claimed to have started, right? Uh, according to Global North definitions. By but... Marina, right? Marina Abramovich? Yes. Marina Abramovich and all of these really... Um, I mean, uh, Ule, her partner, then all of, also IVV, a lot of artists, even Joseph Boys, a lot of people started this in 1960s, right? Mm -hmm. This is Yoko, no? 1967, her piece called, uh, it's called the cut piece where she sits in front of an audience and then she invites the audience to come and if they want to cut a piece of her clothing. And she wants to see the interaction that people have with whether they do it or not and to do a sort of study of what people do when they're given the option to uh, do whatever they want to another person's body and image. So, interesting commentary, 1967. I've put it against another image. Uh, does anybody recognize that, the image on the right? That is not unique. Yes, it is one of the classical forms. It is Kathakali, right? Now, if you see Kathakali, Kathakali originated in the 17th century it always had performance and art together. So performance art may have started in 1960s, but performance in art and art in performance started way before, maybe in the beginning of time for all we know. We just don't have a record of it, right? Let's go to another one. The image on the left is from an artist called Fragonard, and it's from 1767. The image on the right is by an unknown Indian artist, uh, from the Punjabi miniature style, 1750-75. Both have the same imagery, but also different in different styles, right? Imagery is of the swing, style is very different. 
1767 being the common element in both, mid uh, 18th century being the common element in both, mid 18th century is when we are doing something called the Rococo period, according to art history movements. Then we come to, beyond timelines, we come to another work of art. Can you see what's happening on the left? Yeah. Yeah. What do you, you think that is? Really? Used a lot of um, element like fishes and like the natural elements to put together a figure of a human, I guess. Great. Uh, I, I think marine you... life is the theme yeah. marine life. So very right. Yeah, that's great. And can you see what's happening on the right? Yeah, they've used humans to create an animal image. Yeah. So they like kind of spawn. Yeah, sure. that's great. Uh, is the style the same in both? No. It's not, right? One looks a little more a realistic fish put onto a very imaginative character. One is clearly stylized figures, right? Like that's not what a mirror image of a human would look like or a mirror image of a camel would look like. Now, same concept, but very different treatment, both belonging to the same time, one from an Italian artist and one, again, as part of the unknown body of artists from South Asia. Um, yeah. Okay. I think what the point that I'm trying to make is primarily how important it is to go beyond a linear timeline when it comes to any understanding of art history, because it is not that neat. Renaissance time period in Italy looked different than what it looked, the time period only in Persia. Artworks looked different. So this timeline is very global north dominant. And it is important to get away from it to understand the experience uh, that art can allow us to have, right? Because it's not about knowing where the work is from. It's not about knowing who did the work that adds cadence to it. There should be more to the artwork than just its limitations and categories. Yeah. Um, any questions? Yeah. Okay. So the one thing that we definitely do at Atmosphere is we go beyond a linear timeline because I don't think there is any category that can bind the timeline as purely as it is apparent in the kind of books I have read to research on the subject. Um, I'm just gonna give you another snapshot, yeah? What do you see in front of you? Anything familiar? Um. Yes, I, I think I know the one at the right side is from a uh, Dutch uh, painter. And uh, yeah. it looks like the one above is a mix of of this painter with a uh, scenario. Of oh, yeah. In Indian yeah, that I, yeah, that I've just been very imaginative. You can ignore that slide. I've oh, just been imaginative. <laughs> but we just look at these two. Yeah, but thank you. Yeah, that I, I did that because I'm like, no linear timeline everything everywhere all at once mm -hmm. so, but yeah what do you see on the right you recognize it as the dutch artist it's vincent van Hoff. is the landscape of the clouds yeah. uh, the sun and a lot of uh, blue which they used on his time i think a, yes. and no. a nature it's both there it's about nature yeah both are about nature Anything else that you notice in the uh, strokes or in the formations of both the artworks? I feel like it's going like that somewhere. Both of them? You see in that in both? Yeah. That's how you do, uh, Rima. So in our classes, when we're introducing concepts like what is circularity, what is symbolism in round objects, we put Vincent van Gogh perhaps, not as Vincent van Gogh. Nobody tells anybody that this is Vincent van Gogh. We just put the artwork. And we put it alongside Gond artwork. Gond is an Indian uh, folk right. art. I say folk with a lot of trepidation because I don't understand categories in art. I never have and I never will. Uh, what makes something folk? What makes something art? Just art. I don't get it. I think folk art is also art. What are these different uh, abbrevi you know, sort of prefixes we feel like we need to add to things? I have a question, I think. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> what else for compliments? Yeah, thank you. That's I very think there there is a similarity is um the shape. So you you have rectangles or circles and 
um, uh, it has been used shapes to make an. Uh, yeah, absolutely, um, absolutely. So, artist, uh, the time period is not known, but the artist is Manoj Tekam, and the artist here is Vincent Van Gogh, who has been popularized a lot. You'll find him on screensavers, you'll find him on fridge magnets. I have a fridge magnet too with Vincent because I love this work of art. But uh, it's not the only experiment with spirals. That's important to remember. In 1889, it was not the only one experimenting with spirals and continuity and infinity long before the Gonth tribe was already doing something with spirals. It's just that they are now known because of me, Meraki and platforms like that, right? Similarly, let's look at this. What is common between the two? Same thing, shapes? Rima, you're saying shapes. same, right? Yeah. Same, so like the, the, lo using a lot of shapes. Um... Circles, lots of sh uh, circles causing a different kind of shape, right? Within the circle, you can see there's certain sort of squares being an annotated for us to be able to see a lot of shapes, right? Now, this is mm -hmm. Sophia Deloni, another very famous artist who would go to galleries and be represented. But do you see what's on the right? Yes, I know very it's short, it's but it has so many details. Yeah, it has a lot of details. Manisha's uh, geometry. Yeah, that's very right, Manish. Geometry for sure. It's very precise, very hard to do, right? Stuff like this. Form. You just want to make. Yeah. If form and content are both content. false starters, content and form are both, hmm. both false starters, then what is the okay. real starter? If content and form are both non starters, you're saying false. what is false. Yeah. false a false starter. content and form, then what is the starter? Yeah? Mm -hmm. I would say experience. I would say the starter needs to be experience. Form and content come later. That's at least what we talk about in our, and at least that's, and I'll try to explain the reason for that to you. Just stay a little longer with me on this. Yeah? If content and form are the starters, then um one sec i'm thinking in the chat yeah compartment Open. facebook yeah good uh but yeah uh which i'm going to come back to your question once i'm done showing you the artworks if that's okay because i'll have to uh oh. in answering your question i'll have to give up on something that i want to lead up to so if that's okay yeah mm. <laughs> i'm glad that the flow is working <laughs> yeah okay so this is obviously uh one of those uh tibetan mandals that are made, you know, mandal, mandala, as some people say, mm. I have to call it for what it is, mandals, right? Mm -hmm. Concentric circles, which signify infinity. So it's not just that Sophia Deloni was experimenting with geometry, it was being done for years. So her style would fall into something like that's called, uh, maybe in, in modern terms, it would be called something else. It would sometimes, somebody would even call it plasticism. Somebody would call it some otherism and all of that abstract and all of that. But it was happening long back before the isms came into being as well, right? Okay. Um, okay, let's move to this. What do you see happening here? Texture. Oh, that's good. Uh, who said that? That's Alexandra. Yeah. Great. I also want to just say hi to the new uh, new people who've just joined. I think Vanessa has joined and uh, Manish have been responding on chat. So thank you. Um, we're just discussing some works of art to see if we can come up with a way to make art history inclusive. And I just want to start with a tester. So if you have anything to say, please do go ahead and join the conversation. So, Alexandra, you said you see texture in it. Anybody else? It looks like abstraction, like it's going from a figurative to more abstract. Absolutely. That's very right. That's very right. There's so many ways to see this, right? Uh, we bring this up in our sessions when we're talking about texture, as was suggested by Alexandra. There's a texture that you can 
you know the kind of painting you want to go and touch i have a lot of those paintings uh, that i almost always feel like touching and then the museum guard is like no priya that's not okay uh yeah 3d depth the second is mm -hmm. uh, actually a, a cloth it's the kent cloth right it's it's ghanian the mm. third is a painting um, it's it's a mix between painting and quilting by an artist who um sorry i'm just getting him um, okay uh, pipa yeah an artist who works with quilting and also with painting um, so very interesting texture, both versions happening. And then you have this, which is uh, a creation by street art, where they've gone around covering the walls of a, a, a home for the blind with texture. So children there can experience art by just touching the walls, right? Now, what happens when you strip the artworks of the names of the artists and their context and their timelines and just introduce the work of art as an example of texture? You're basically adding more to somebody's contextual awareness of what it's what texture can do, right? It's not about texture can do this in Renaissance, texture can do this in Rococo, texture can do this in Cubism, but talking about what texture in general has been doing just by experiencing it, right? Just looking at this, Alexandra could say it's texture. So this is primarily a snapshot of what we do. Yeah, Vishwa. This comes the closest to Pinterest. Pinterest. And then okay. Pinterest is documenting things. And then you take ideas out of the zeitgeist. And you yeah. try to blend them. Sure. This comes the closest to Pinterest for me at this moment. Okay. I don't know anything, but I, it seems like they're mine. Yeah, no, no, definitely. There's a reason the algorithm works so well there. But um, the point that I wanted to make by showing you these artworks and by starting off the conversation with the normative sort of art history is that everything is not so neat and pure. It's not so neat to say that Renaissance will have these features because you know, 1550 in Persia looked very different than what it looked like, say, in Italy. It looked very different. So if you're talking about Renaissance in certain terms, you're just talking about a certain place and time and artist. You're not talking about a movement. You're not talking about art as art in that particular century, in that particular moment. Making art history a little more reductive than something that you can learn from. So what we are doing with Artmosphere primarily is showing artworks based on not a limiting definition of art, but through something that we call theme-based art history. Now, what is a theme-based art history? Something that you notice is, uh, you know, and I believe this, and um, I'm gonna go down a rabbit hole of such site existentialism and an, an ism of my own, but um, we all, uh, there's certain things which are pervasive, we experienced right uh, we are trying to do something by creating a curriculum which is uh, about emotions or experiences which are pervasive for example the experience of nature everybody has that experience of memory everybody has that um just gonna check what's in the chat yeah perfect that's good 15 minutes is good yeah so we have all of that happening. So we've come up with these booklets that we call, uh, so Art and Nature is one of our booklets, right? And there are multiple other booklets that we work with. I'm just going to show you a snapshot of the curriculum to see how this absolute bizarre and confused and chaotic way of talking about art sometimes actually works, right? So to answer your question, Vishwa, what we do is we talk about art within a theme. So that's a scaffolding that we give it. So we're going to talk about nature today. People have their impressions of nature. They have their experience of nature, right? From there, we show a couple of works of art without any context. We're like, okay, how does it feel? What do you think about it? Do you have a relationship with it? Do you not? Even not having an emotion is an emotion, right? Being passive about it, passively consuming it. That's also something that we count as a feeling, right? After all of that conversation happens, then we slip into, let's talk about a little of the context. Let's talk about the time. Does that give you anything? But it's always an artwork first approach that we use, which then leads to an emotions first approach. 
which is a slightly more democratic way to understand art because it does not require you to know the things that say people with more access will know. So most of our work is not in, uh, we work in across social economic spaces. We work with NGOs, we work with uh, women's groups, we work in other spaces as well. And the idea is that how do you make art history inclusive for everybody, not for people who have access to Pinterest, not just for people who have access to say the internet or AI, it's also about how can you have an experience for that? Because honestly, there's a lot to learn from people who've not had access to gallery art about art, which is why we bring in Gon, which is why we bring in Budli, because community art is the only kind of art that there was for a very long time before museums and galleries came around to be, right? So to give an example of art and nature, we bring in comparatives, we bring in a lot of conversations. If there's a tree of life, we'll show how it's done in Austria, and we'll also show how it's done in Mithila, in Mithila artwork by certain artists. If we're talking about what nature interactions artists have had, we'll show conceptual work on the right, left side, we'll show miniatures, we'll show cyanotypes, we'll show spiral jetties from all over the world. And we'll be like, have a conversation about it. Once they have that conversation, we'll be like, okay, now you want to know the context? Now do you want to know a little more about, if you like this particular work of art, you want to explore this artist a little more? So it's not about telling the student or the learner that today we're going to look at the masters. Find your own inspirations, find your own models who you want to model your artist persona on or learn from. And you can only do that if there's a heterogeneous display to you. Otherwise, every other work of art would look like David and every other woman would look like Mona Lisa. And God knows we have enough of those in the world. We need a little more diversity in the way art is represented and the way artists represent art as well and how people, and I work very closely with children, how children expect art to look. Uh, for them, if the world is as limited as just David, um, it's not fair to them, I think. They need to know more than just tokenistic representations as well. So we go from, so then the conversations of form and content come in. We talk about where you see nature around you now. So let's take an excursion together. Did you know this was inspired by an artwork done long back? Those kind of conversations allow us to move from a place of learning to a place of play and curiosity. And I just want to give you an example of what this has allowed in our learning spaces. In our learning spaces, this is one of the most recent artworks I saw from a student. Now, the instruction was to be talking about questions and the instruction art and questions. And the instruction was the only instruction was to create a question mark and then interpret it the way you want. So I don't know if you can see it, but Half of the face is actually a question mark with that black dot, which is meeting bird. I don't know if you can see that. Started off as a question mark. And then the student decided, I want to make a self-portrait out of it. Yeah, because the question mark can be turned into that. And it touched my heart much like it touched yours, Alexandra, I can see. <laughs> and I'll help you reading uh, in reading what's on the top left. So, And then she populated it with questions. Lots of questions that she has about life and other things, right? And I'm supposed to bring answers for this, as I promised her in the next session that we have in the coming week. Her uh, question yes, is, yes. Very good uh, you. yeah, her question is, uh, Hamara chehra kon banata hai? That's in Hindi. I'll translate it. Who makes our faces? Who makes our faces? How do we look the way we look? And she's a seven-year-old kid, right? But our conversations on non-canonical art, which is we're showing lots of artworks, but we're not telling her, oh, this is from Italy, this is from Greece, this is from France, this is from UK, this is from India. We're not doing any of that. We're like, this is just a plethora of ways that artists have addressed questions. Do you like it? Do you want to think a little about it? And then we allow the space to create that. And this is what comes out of it. There's a certain curiosity. None of the artworks we had shown looked like this. But this is what it sparked in this little inquisitive girl and she created this lovely thing with lots of questions and then one of the questions says Sabse pehle dunia mein kon aata hai? which says who comes to who came first to the earth you know now i have a really tough task at my hands to be able to answer these questions next week but it will start a conversation it will start a really lovely conversation with between somebody in her 30s and somebody who's eight all because we facilitated a slightly non-canonical art historic art history lesson so that's what I meant by making art history inclusive. It's not about her knowing that it was Vinci or it was Van Gogh or it was Raza or it was Emma Hussain or, you know, all these people. 
It was about knowing that, yes, I have a relationship with the work that I saw and it led me to creating this. Just a few more examples of the artworks that we have seen. This one is particularly special to me. This was with a group of uh, therapists when we worked with them. Um, I've blocked out the face of the therapist. That's her picture, but I just wanted to preserve her identity. But this is her talking about, um, on the. this is how she interpreted it for me. On the right side is her childhood. On the left side is her adult persona. Above her image, above the yellow face that you see is everything that she thought mattered. But on the right is everything that she now believes matters. So the little child that you see eating the cake is her reaching out a hand to the adult version saying, can you hold me? And this all just happened because we had an art history lesson about art and stories. It was immediately after that. We like looking at artworks that tell stories. Now, there was no context to be given before engagement with the works. We showed the works and then we said, okay, let's talk about what time period they are. Okay, this is from World War. This is from Indian independence. This is from Bangladesh uh, liberation, all of that. We had that conversation after the artwork was shown, not before, no prefacing which allows the space to play with the artwork and allows your mind to explore it before you've already fed it with information because then you start looking for certain things in it. How about not doing that? How about seeing it with absolute surrender and abandon and with no information? I know it's very hard to digest because we're so used to knowing, knowing things that sometimes when we don't know it, it's daunting. But the whole idea here is that when you don't do that, it leads to you playing with curiosity with your own art, art, if possible. And they're not artists are the ones I'm talking about. They're not artists like that. So everybody is, right? This is another work of art that came out of the conversations. Uh, this is the figure. Uh, it's a person, uh, the figure originally is headless. The image is headless. It's a reimagining of the swing painting I showed you. So the artist who did this, the student in the learning center, she put a giant, mouth on top of where the head should have been and in the background you can see there's obviously uh, some imagination of hot air balloons and before that a very sort of what you would imagine to be minarets in south asian spaces right and then there's a camera capturing that moment and she said this is primarily me being really loud because i'm usually very quiet so i want to be very pronounced and that's why the garment is the way it is right so all of these conversations came up from this space because we primarily focus on more access, which means more contextual awareness and spreading it out and no hierarchy between the artworks. So we intrinsically make hierarchies as humans when we're talking about certain spaces, certain artists. How about introducing it without any of that context? When you don't have the hierarchy at play, you don't know what you're supposed to like and what you're not supposed to like. And in that process, you tend liking what you actually want to like. So it's closer to being authentic than being what the world needs you to understand as art history and art appreciation. So it's about finding your own artist persona. A lot of what we do is backed by our own observations from our classrooms, happy to share information. We have our impact assessments, but also by neuroesthetics. Again, I'm happy to share information about our research with neuroesthetics and how the brain responds to art and why we do what we do. But most of our work has been done by observation and confirmed by external research. We genuinely believe in observing rather than jumping into academic research and then implementing. So what we thought we were doing, we implemented it, we did it, and then it has been confirmed by what we've read in neuroesthetics. So again, there's no ism guiding us. It is uh, intention and experience which has guided this experience, this sort of experience of inclusive art history. Thank <music> you.